ended up trading for Justin Verlander. Framber Valdez, no hitter, 93 pitches. Ooh, the franchise now has 16 in its history, the most in baseball. And watch, everybody celebrates, but up, oh, Dusty's gotta finish that scorecard. <laughs> How the champs are set up, and what's reality, and what's something more, with USA great Carly Lloyd criticizing Team USA as they advance to the knockout stage. Let's go around the horn. Trade deadline results. Looking for a biggest winner, maybe a biggest loser. The headline, Justin Verlander to Houston. It's going to be so weird seeing him in an Astros jersey. Tim, you said this would happen Friday. I re I, I've never given out points for trade deadline predictions before. I'm doing it right here. There, boy. Are the Astros the big win in the deadline? And what did they just do, Timmy? I think what they did is what they needed to do to catch up with, with what the Rangers had done. The Rangers had added Max, Max Scherzer and Jordan Montgomery. And actually, the last two months, Montgomery and St. Louis has been better than Scherzer was mm. with the Mets. So with the Rangers adding two, the Astros needed to add at least one with some of their injury concerns. But they got the big one. They got the guy who was a Cy Young Award winner there last year. And it's hard to look at that team. You know, if it wasn't for that little thing that happened in 2017 with Trash Kids, we would view this team very differently, obviously. That little the thing, last yes, World of course. Series, that little thing. And, and they look like the best team in the American League again. Now, they haven't caught the Rangers. They're a half game behind. Still got that half game. But uh, Verlander to Houston, it just seemed to make sense. And now they're, they're the definite favorites. Emily Kaplan, Houston now the definite favorite in the American League for you? I don't know if they're the de – yeah, they're, they're probably the definite favorite. But there's a lot of teams within their division that are just as good. I don't think we can call them the clear winner of this trade deadline. So you look at what the Angels did, and they're finally acting like a team that has two generational talents on its roster and doing everything it can to make Otani happy. But I can't get over what the Astros did here. You have a beloved player who's won for you, who's performed for you. You want to re-sign him in free agency. He goes somewhere else where they pay him more, and then you get him at a discount yeah. price. It's like wanting a TV on – then waiting for Black Friday and getting the TV anyway. It's quite incredible and now their rotation is so good they potentially have a six-man rotation once our kitty comes back david dennis jr houston just become the favorite to repeat here well first of all i want to shout out the around the horn production staff for that wonderful photoshopping of verlander on those astros uniforms those highlights <laughs> incredible job <laughs> there no yeah this puts the astros that? astros and, and Texas are right there. It seems like we're going to have what the Mets thought they were going to have last year, which is a Verlander Scherzer uh, fighting for a World Series contention. That seems to be the move here. But I want to go back to what, what Emily just said. I love what the Angels have done and this, this, you know, spirit of a team that is acting like somebody who is cramming for a test right before the day before the test because they just realized they have to try to keep Otani. So they made a ton of moves, They're scrambling to keep this guy. Are they going to make the playoffs probably not six percent chance they're going to win the world series no but they are finally acting like a squad that wants to keep the best player in the league on that team okay and kevin blackstone your trade deadline winner oh it's got to be the astros i mean dusty's got the band back together again remember the Wish astros as i think tim <laughs> <laughs> yeah as tim kind of alluded to remember they had some injuries in their pitching staff they lost garcia they lost mccullers now you get back Verlander. Was he, is he as strong now as he was a year ago? Not quite, but remember, he's coming off that injury at the beginning of the year. He's still pitching strong right now, and he's back in a place where you know he's comfortable. So that's a big, big winner um, for, the, for the Astros And to be right perpetually the all champs. in, that's what the defending champs are. They don't have a Absolutely. top 100 player, top 100 prospect right now, but they're all in. And now we look at a team that... Many think might be the biggest loser, the Yankees. They went nearly the whole day without making a move. Their fans can't believe it. So then they release, welcome to New York, Keaton Middleton and Spencer Howard. <laughs> they went out immediately and went down to Tampa 5-0. They lost 5-2. Fire Cashman chance heard at the stadium. They're wild card six right now. Spoiler alert, there is no wild card six. And then today, news of the day, they demoted Howard, the reliever with the 10 ERA they just traded for, to AAA. Tim, back around the horn to you. Are the Yankees the biggest loser at the deadline? I don't know that they're a loser at the deadline. I think they're a loser in the way Brian Cashman has built that team the last...
three or four yeah. years. And, you know, mostly for a while he just was content to go get players from bad Ranger teams like Joey Gallo or Willie Calhoun or Kiner Falefa and Trevino. Some of those guys are gone. Some of them are still there. But then the other moves like Josh Donaldson, DJ LeMayhew, thinking these guys have a lot left when they really don't. And you look at that lineup every day around Judge, and you look at those OPSs down the right column, and it, a few of them are cracking over 700. But, I mean, they're just – they have nothing there. So I don't think there were a lot of moves for them. I don't think one or two trades of prospects would have got them where they needed to go. There's a reason they're the last place team in the East. Emily Kapler. Well, they're definitely not winners the way that Brian Cashman has built that team over the last few years. They're at risk of finishing under 500 for the first time since 92. But my big loser are the New York Mets. When Steve Cohen took over, one of the first things he said, day one of ownership, if we don't win a World Series in three to five years, it will be disappointing. Here we are at year three, mm -hmm. and they're selling at the deadline. And one of the players they trade away, Max Scherzer, revealed in a leak their conversations that they're probably not looking at year four or year five of being competitive either. So you throw a bunch of money and saying, we want to be a competitive team right now. Now you are now throwing a bunch of money to try to build a farm system while still spending that money on the players not playing for your team. I feel bad for Matt's fans, but I also feel like they're uniquely prepared to stomach Perhaps, the but the fire sale after saying there wouldn't be a fire sale, and you alluded to Max Scherzer talking about a conversation he had with the GM. Do you think that's okay for him to say? Do you believe it completely, or are you willing to wonder if it's sour grapes for a pitcher who didn't pitch as well there? I don't think it was sour grapes as much as it was him just being candid about a situation where he came, there were so many expectations, and it didn't work out, and he was trying to justify himself to the fans, so I appreciated that level of transparency. So I've got one New York team is the biggest loser. I've got another New York team is the biggest loser. David Dennis Jr., your, your biggest loser of the trade deadline. Yeah, as much as I want to um, sort of harp on the Reds not improving that pitching, which is something that they sort of desperately needed at the trade deadline that's been sort of a, a, a problem for them all season, it's hard to go to say that the loser is not the team whose crowd was chanting for them to fire the guy who makes the trade decisions at the deadline. So you got to say the Yankees are the biggest loser. As Tim said, I don't think there are a lot of moves that could have propelled them to a World Series, especially where their standings are. Right now, they still have a 23% uh, chance to, uh, to make that wild card. But some of the moves that made were insults to injury. Like, you are top, you know, bottom 10 in offense, top four in relief pitching, and you add people who don't help your offense but help your pitching. And then Cashman says, we're going all in. Well, you did not go all in. It's the comments and the moves that you made that are insulting in addition to the lack of movement that you made in the deadline. You have a black stone. But what you all are saying is the biggest losers are... Who? New York baseball fans all across the city. They got nothing to root for. You got a team in you got a team in the Yankees that even when Aaron Judge came back, they could only muster out a win so far. You got a team in the Mets who who loaded up with the richest man, the richest owner in sports, in Steve Cohen, and built what a three hundred and fifty million dollar payroll or whatever crazy was, and couldn't get a thing out of it. And now they've dumped all the things in a in some in some heap. Uh, near the river somewhere, and now they're going to try and start to, build, to, to get back into it. It's a joke. Well, I mentioned what the York, Yankees' first move was after the deadline, which was to demote one of the guys they just got. The Mets' first move was to lose an extra innings on a bulk last night. That's how the Mets lost last night. And that team right now paying players $151 million to play for them and $153 million to not play for them, to play for other teams. I'll give you one last team if you want to nominate a biggest loser, Tim Kalisha. Well, I just think Cleveland deserves a special award. They were a game out of first, and they're trading off their healthiest pitcher to Tampa Bay yeah, yeah. And, and another American League rival. They're trading off Rosario to the Dodgers and Josh Bell to the Marlins. And one game out, and, and they're saying, yeah. They've elected to go with a youth we'll, movement, we'll play for which is at least different than the, 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 the New York teams, which are not even doing that. One more story here from the trade deadline. Eduardo Rodriguez, he blocked the trade. So he's not being traded at the deadline. He blocked the trade to the Dodgers. He chose the Tigers, staying with the Tigers, choosing out of the playoffs over first place. And he pitched today and pitched very well this afternoon for Detroit. One of the more memorable appearances of his career, of course, was Boston versus L.A. People enjoyed wondering, does he not like the Dodgers because of this? Nope, nope. In reality, he declined the trade per his contract. The Dodgers, one of 10 teams he had a no trade to. And the reporting is there are family reasons. David, I turn to you. How do you view a team trying to trade a player they knew he had a no trade to? And how do you view a team 
who knew they had the no trade but still trying to get a player and the player saying no. You know, a, a lot of the conversation in the last week and a half has been about the NFL with running backs and the way their contracts are and people looking at the running backs and saying, well, you signed the contract, fulfill the contract. Well, same thing you could say to these franchises. You gave the guy a contract in which he had a no trade clause, so don't act surprised when he utilizes the no trade clause in his contract. This is not about him. This is about the franchises who are trying to negotiate a trade with the guy who specifically has the Dodgers listed as a team that he can say no to, and you're acting surprised when he says no to them. So this is on them, and, you know, whatever uh, Ed Rodgers' reasons were for not going, those are his reasons. He's had some family issues, and he is well within his right to do what he earned in his contract and stay pat. Hey, B. Shout out to Kurt Flood once again. This is what Kurt Flood was all about, right? You can, you can get a contract and make a decision as to where you want your future to be, where you want your present to be. And this is what he has decided to do. So I, I applaud him for this and not running out to the palm trees out in, out in L.A. and staying in Detroit, a city that's on the, on the comeback right now. My man Don Gagne from NPR just moved back to, Chicago, uh, back to uh, Detroit um, in, the, in the past okay. year. This yes. is a place that's happening. So get back there. Thank they got you. the whole electric grid electric car grid thing they're trying to put in in downtown Detroit, trying to move into the future. I like that. Thank you for that, Kevin Blackstone. Emily Kathleen on maybe Eduardo Rodriguez here. <laughs> yeah, I hate when teams do this. It's a privilege. You earn that language in your contract, and it's your right to be able to maintain it. You never know what someone's going through, as Dan David said. You know, in my sport hockey, this just happened recently. Tori Krug, they tried to trade him from the Blues to the Flyers. He nixed it. All the Blues fans were mad at him. He said, no, if I go to the Flyers, they're just going to flip me again. You want me to move my family twice? Also, shame on the Tigers, though. If he had a 10-team, no trade list, he must have really not want to go to L.A. So for them to go down this process to and then bring well, it to him. Maybe L.A. just flat out wanted him. L.A. needed sure, to make some moves. Sure, then, I thought they did. He, and then for them, yeah, but then for them to say, oh, we have no other options. Well, you could have figured out other options if you had open lines of communication. Also, this is a guy that's won a World Series before. It's not like he's so desperate to win right now. Tim Keller for last week. I get so tired of hearing athletes, especially in the NBA, oh, I've got to play in L.A. Here's a man who said, I want to keep my Shinola watch. I want to show some Motor City uh, pride. More Detroit right pride. I, <laughs> so, yeah, fun. good for Eduardo. Stick with Detroit. All right. We showed that play where, uh, where the home run he let up, he spiked the uh, the glove. Who won that game? Who won that series? He's, he's got a lot in uh, his review and a lot looking forward after his great start today for Detroit. By herself next. You want to see the Lions and Red Wings resurgence. World Cup now. The while you were sleeping results from today. Jamaica drawing Brazil and knocking Marta out. The reggae girls had a GoFundMe set up by a player's mother to finance the trip, and now they're on to the knockout stage. Also, South Africa in a thrilling comeback stoppage time win to take down Italy. So now it's official. Sunday, it will be USA, Sweden. World number one versus world number three in the round of 16. After Team USA had its poorest showing in the group stage in history. The shock of that... And the criticism of that was immediate on the telecast. All-time great player Carly Lloyd, now a Fox analyst, citing a lack of passion. Quote, lackluster, uninspiring, taking it for granted performance is what she called it. Then, while saying that, images of post-game dancing on the field came in and Lloyd and the whole Fox crew critical of that, which got even more attention. Coach Vladko Andonovsky said it's insane to question the team's passion to win. Lloyd today on Fox, quote, I want people to understand that I care deeply about this team, end quote. And she stressed that the legacy gets passed down from team to team, and with that must come hard work and focus. Emily Kaplan, there's a lot there. How do you consider Lloyd's criticism? You know, with those Sean Ka Payton comments about Nathaniel Hackett, there's all this talk about the unspoken code in sports. And the unspoken code is if you're a former athlete and you're on one of these desks, you're supposed to be complimentary of your former teammates, but that's not who Carly Lloyd is. This is authentic to her. She's been making these same pointed comments since her final days as a player. So I'm glad she said it. I just think she's barking up the wrong tree. We should be questioning the lack of subs for a team that's so deep. The tackle, how do they only score four goals in three matches? But the celebration of the dancing, enjoying it, like, I never want to be an athlete that retires and said, I didn't appreciate the moment that I was in. I didn't actually enjoy it while I was there. The rest of the world is caught up. The U.S. isn't the big superpower anymore. It's tough to get out of the group stage. Celebrate it, but then move on. David Dennis Jr., this is the second time Team USA has failed to win their group. Sixth time they haven't scored. 
first time they haven't won successive matches uh, in, in these tournaments. There's a lot to be critical of and the way that they're executing. But the thing that you can should not be critical of is talking about their heart and their passion because they're celebrating after advancing. And you, one of the people who was out there celebrating was Megan Rapino, who is somebody you could not ever say does not have the heart, the passion, or the the will to win. So you have a team that is you know getting as far as they can. They're still in you know favor to win, and so you cannot question those intangibles like heart and all that stuff when they're just not playing well. Kevin Blackstone. But, you know, even us on this show at times have criticized teams that have celebrated backing into a playoff or backing into a, a bigger game. And so I think that's part of what's happened here. The only other thing I would say is you want to talk about equality in, in sports, then one of the things we need to do is be equal in our criticism. And I think sometimes when the women's team has slipped up a little bit or been a little bit less than what we've expected of them as they have been in this particular tournament, then sometimes people get uh, a little nervous about calling them out. And I think it's it's fair to call them out. Their play has not been that good. They know that, and that's fine. As far as the dancing and all that, I don't really care about that. But certainly, when you're number one in the world, you're the USA, you've got all this marvelous talent, and you're not living up to it, that is deserving of criticism. Do you see a distinction between questioning a passion or focus, like Lloyd did, and questioning, well, maybe they're not playing well? Yeah, I, I, I think I would stick to not playing well and point out the, the statistics that back that up. It's hard to know to get inside somebody's mind and heart, but she's a person who's been there, and she knows the people that to uh, for whom she is talking about. Tim Uh I think there's a couple different things here, as my colleagues have stated. Post-game activities, dancing, I don't care about that. We seem to have all these rules. We don't like celebrations. We don't like you talking to the other team. You're supposed to hate that other team. So we got all these things we want to see from athletes after games, and they're all kind of silly. Everything else is very valid. When you have a nil-nil draw with Portugal, and you're supposed to still be the best team in the world, or at least competing for that, and that, that, that's what you throw out after a 1-1 tie with Netherlands, you're not really showing much. But I don't think it's a lack of heart or, or whatever. We, we say that a lot, too, when a team just isn't good enough. Oh, I can't believe they came out flat. No, maybe they came out not very good. And this team isn't as good as past American women's teams have been. And they may run into a big problem when they face Sweden in a couple days. David Dennis Jr., back in. Yeah, I want to go back to something you mentioned at the very beginning, which I do not want to gloss over, which is Team Jamaica and what they have done with that GoFundMe and getting as far as they can to this elimination stage and what happens when we have these teams that are underfunded by these federations. So often it happens in women's sports where they have to overcome the lack of funding and the lack of support to get where they need to get. The same for Nigeria, the same for South Africa. So often these stores are tethered to what they're not getting instead of just being able to celebrate how well they're performing now on the field. Now what they are, teams, players, receive monetary bonus from FIFA now for advancing to the knockout stage. That was not always the case. Emily Cabin, last word. Yeah, and how cool was it for Marta on her way out to go up to Bunny Shaw, the star of the Jamaica team, and just show that her respect and love. For the U.S., though, I hope it is a wake-up call. They only uh, completed 62% of their classes, but it's also a wake-up call for the rest of us because now because they finished second, they have all these terrible games not in prime time, so I'm going to be sleepy the next couple weeks. Thank you for your time, Emily Kaplan and Dave Dennis Jr., Tim Kalashaw. And wearing the same shirt, Kevin Blackstone? What are we doing today? It's like they used to do it in the yeah. halls of the Dallas Morning News. I got the memo. Yeah. Eight, 20, 10, triple double in league history last night. Who else but Alyssa Thomas? What a year for her. Fifth triple double of the season. Exactly 21 points, 20 rebounds, 12 assists, three steals, one block, and zero turnovers in the Suns' win over Minnesota. Also last night, Aces clinched a playoff spot already with a third of the season left. They're 24-2, which is exactly where Houston was for a 26 game when the Comets set the league record. Tim, what's the bigger W? Wow. I'm not always one to go nuts over triple doubles, but when a triple double is attached to 20 points, 20 rebounds, career high, 20 rebounds, zero turnovers, it's like a perfect game. Give me, give me a list, Thomas, and what she did last KB? night. KB? Oh, that's pretty good, but I'm going to go with the Aces, who are about to obliterate the best record in the WNBA, which was the Comets back in 98. You probably remember that, Tim. 
team had like four all, uh, Hall of Famers on it. Incredible what they're and doing. This right. ace team very well may put up that number or more going forward. But um, Alyssa Thomas, triple double parade this season is getting the point. We'll move on. How the Houston Astros responded to trading Justin Verlander. I said it earlier. Framber Valdez, no hitter, 93 pitches. That's the fewest pitches in a no hitter in 24 years. I was going to say it was no sweat for him, but it was a nice sweat because it's like 190 degrees in Houston yesterday. He only had one walk and double played that immediately, as you just saw right there. Kevin, it's the debate of the day. You got to pick one. What's more impressive in today's game? No hits? Or 93 pitches to complete a game. Oh, uh, no, it's 93 pitches. I mean, this is the spirit of baseball right now, right? Brevity. Get it done now. Get in and out of the game. Mm -hmm. TC? Getting the Guardians out quickly. Isn't that impressive now that they've tanked the season? Give me the no-hitter, <laughs> the 16th no-hitter in Houston Astros history. That's what it's Brevity. about. Brevity. Brevity. Always quick. KB, uh, be brief. 30 seconds. Too long. Thank you very much. I just want to pick up on something that David Dennis was talking about with the women's tournament, which has been really thrilling. But how about the diaspora, the African diaspora really breaking through and these teams coming through? Forget for a minute Jamaica having to put together a GoFundMe to get there. How about Haiti with all the hell and damnation coming down on that country and those women were still able to put together a team that qualified for this. And then Linda Casero with, um, with Colombia cancer survivor 18 years old she is the woman of this tournament in my in my estimation thanks for your time david levitard in our hearts